All right. Um, thank you so much for coming to the uh, nurse user group meeting. I'm really excited to see uh, so many people here, both in person and online. Um, so for those who don't know me, uh, you actually do know me. <laughs> My name is Rebecca Hartman Baker. I lead the user engagement group and I send you an email every week. <laughs> <laughs> that email. <laughs> that email. <laughs> yes. Um, so anyway, um, I am. I'm actually. It's really kind of funny when I go to a conference in person. People see my name tag and they're like, oh, "I know you. You send me an email every week." Yes, I do. Yes, I do. One person one time asked me if it was personalized. And so, I, of course, I said yes. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk to you about an overview of, you know, how we've done in the past year. And um, obviously, the answer is awesome, A+, plus, but uh, hopefully uh, you, you all will agree with me, too. So first, I just want to talk, so uh, a quarter of our users every year are brand new. So I just kind of want to talk to those of you who might be new about NERSC and who we are and what we do. So we are the Mission HPC Center for the DOE Office of Science Researchers. So the Office of Science is part of the Department of Energy. And so you heard from Jordan earlier, she's our program manager within the Office of Science. And it is the largest funder of physical science research in the United States. Um, and so there are, sort of these six main areas um, where they have, uh, they have a focus. Um, the Department of Energy is kind of interested in anything related to energy, uh, including things that you might not think would be related to energy, but they actually are. So uh, biological and environmental research. So uh, environment, you might think, well, why do they care about that? Well, uh, for example, when the climate changes, that's going to change the way people use energy, right? There's going to be a lot more air conditioners, things like that. Uh, and biology, they're interested in uh, genomes, especially genomes of, of plants that could potentially be used as biofuels or, or a bacteria or fungi that you could use to break down uh, biomaterials to make energy. Um, so computing, that's pretty obvious. That's why we're here today. Um, but they also do research in fundamental uh, areas in computing, like algorithms, numerical methods, things like that. Uh, basic energy sciences, um, that seems really obvious, has the word energy in it, right? Um, high energy physics, um, nuclear physics, and you may wonder, like, mm, nuclear physics, like, well, it's not just, uh, it's not just, like, the nucleus, but also fusion, fission, you know, those are all fundamental nuclear operations that could produce energy. High energy physics, uh, likewise, there's a lot of fundamental um, science in that that could be applied towards fusion research um, and other energy research. And then, of course, fusion energy and plasma physics. So those are kind of like the six sort of sub areas uh, in the Office of Science. And um, there are different uh, sort of program managers which within each of those areas that who have kind of a specific focus within those areas. Now NERSC, um, so we have a, a plan. So every few years we get a new machine. And so for those of you who may have been around for a while, we had Edison in 2013 and that was our seventh machine. Uh, it arrived in 2013. Uh, and then we have Corey, and it kind of arrived in 2016. That was our eighth machine. Uh, Perlmutter, our ninth machine, arrived in 2021. It's finally all settled in and ready to go for you all. And then we are already working on NERSC 10. We expect that to be sort of an exascale type of a system. And we think it'll probably arrive in around 2026. Okay. Um, so the systems that we have on the floor or have had on the floor right now. Um, so we had Corey. Everybody loves Corey now that it's, especially now that it's gone. Everybody's <laughs> very fond of it. Um, but it was retired on May 31st. 
Um, and Perlmutter is currently our flagship system at NERSC. Um, so it has uh, 1,792 uh, GPU accelerated nodes, each of them has four GPUs, and then 3,072 um, CPU nodes, and each of those has two AMD uh, Milan CPUs in them. Um, it has a whole lot of memory. It has the HPE Cray Slingshot High Speed Interconnect, and it debuted on the uh, top 500 list as the fifth most powerful system. Unfortunately, um, as with anything, if you don't do anything, the only direction you have to go is down on the top 500 list. So we're down to number nine, but still that's pretty awesome. Uh, and it has 140 petaflop peak performance. So in addition to those systems, we also have a very large HPSS tape archive where people can store their data more long-term. Um, and of course we have our um, community file system and um, our home file systems. And of course, we're connected in to uh, ESNet to make uh, everyone be able to connect to NERSC and to get their data and put their data at NERSC very efficiently. Okay, so if you get an allocation at NERSC, um, about 80% of our allocations come from, uh, from DOE Mission Science Cool. And so this is distributed by DOE Office of Science Program Managers. So I kind of talked about that a little bit before, how there's those six programs, six big programs, and then each of them has somebody who serves as their uh, allocation manager within that program. And then um, another 10% of our allocations go through what we call ALCC. ALCC is, um, is a, a, an acronym within an acronym. So that stands for the Oscar Leadership Computing Challenge. And these awards are run by the Oscar office. That's the Advanced Scientific Computing Research Office. That's the office that Jordan is in. Um, and so they run these awards and these are kind of high, high risk, but potentially high payoff projects. Um, and then the remaining 10% is our director's reserve. These are strategic awards from us. So we've used these for various things in the past, um, including uh, quantum research most recently. So something to note here is that at NERSC, we pretty much don't pick our own users. You all get selected by the DOE Office of Science Allocation Managers. So um, I think that's pretty cool. So. Uh, you all are amazing. You produce groundbreaking scientific research. There's at least 2,000, somewhere between 2,000 and 2,500 papers every year that acknowledge NERSC in, their, in the paper um, for using our resources. Um, and that is more than any other HPC center that we know of. So, and like by an order of magnitude. So you all are amazing and we love you. And this is why we exist. So let's talk more about you. Okay, so these are stats from 2022, but I think not a lot has changed. It, you know, the, the overall sentiment about them is going to remain the same. So we had uh, in 2022, we had 9,781 users across over a thousand projects. Our users are from all 50 states, plus we have users internationally and a lot of other countries. Uh, we, we took a look at how many years people had been a nurse user uh, from our stats last year. And in fact, a quarter, almost a quarter, 24.4%, it almost rounds to 25, uh, were brand new every year. This is, a, this is a trend we've seen every year. We have about a quarter of our users are brand new. Um, and then another quarter of our users are like one to three years. So that's, uh, um, that's pretty amazing. That means that about half of our users are uh, less than three years using NERSC, probably more than half of our users. And also we have a plurality of students, as you can see from these beautiful graphics that I did not create. Um, 
So about a third of our users are graduate students. Uh, and then another 8% undergrads, and then we've got almost 20% postdocs. So the majority of our users are early in their careers. 60% um, of you come from universities, almost 30% from DOE labs, and 5% from other government labs. We actually have 4% from industry. Um, so anyway, I think that's pretty impressive. Uh, our top institutions, so uh, I, I think I can do this here. Maybe we can get a little online participation too. Okay, so is, uh, raise your hand or um, I don't know if you can do an emo emoji or something online. If you are from one of these top six universities and everybody here, raise your hand or something if you're, if you're from one of these places. All right, Woo, congratulations. Okay, we got one. I was just scratching. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that counts too, you graduated from one. Okay, cool. All right, um, and then we've got our top five DOE labs. We didn't actually include Berkeley Lab in this list, but it really, it's probably number one. <laughs> but it's kind of lame, like, everybody. Need to say what's already known. Everybody, <laughs> exactly, no need to say what's already known. You know, like if we said, everybody raise your hand from, okay. Well, anyway, do we have anybody from one of these five labs? So you can raise your hand or you can do a little emoji or, or something online. Anybody from one of these? Yay, congratulations. Yay, thank you for coming today. I was right. Oregon when I first became a nurse user. Does that count? It counts, it totally counts. Okay, terrific. All right, well, congratulations, everybody. All right, um, so our compute hours are broken down by DOE program. So, um, you know, that 80% piece of the pie, um, it goes and different amounts go to different areas. And so, <clears throat> um, so you can see that we got a lot of folks uh, from high energy physics who are using our uh, using our resources. Okay, anybody raise your hand if you're from high energy physics, raise your hand or, or emojis or whatever. All right, we got some. All right, congratulations, everybody. Good on you. All right, anybody doing materials science? Materials. Okay, yeah, we got some good ones here. Okay, uh, chemical sciences, geosciences, and biosciences. Anybody, anybody from those areas? Okay, all right, yay. Okay. Great, we got a lot of a lot of people here, um, and so then of course um, fusion energy and plasma science. Do we have anybody representing that area? Okay, yeah, we got one in here. Anybody else? Okay, Torin, yay! Um, and then uh, nuclear physics. I, I had to at least get down there so Peter could raise his hand. <laughs> All right, good uh, good job. Keep up the good work. Okay. All right, so let's talk about NERSC systems. So first I want to just talk about what's happened since we were last together, beloved users. So um, we had some big upgrades and improvements to Perlmutter. Um, so I checked, I checked last year's presentations and we were still working on a network upgrade, which we completed um, shortly after the NUG meeting, uh, we had to do some remanufacturing of our nodes and network interface cards at that time. Those were all completed. Uh, we added some additional uh, nodes into Perlmutter. So pretty much like half of the CPU nodes, we still had yet to integrate into the machine last year at this time. And then we integrated an additional 256 high memory GPU nodes. So these have a higher memory than the rest of the GPU nodes. And then of course, we had numerous software and hardware upgrades during that period. Um, another big thing that we did was that we upgraded these network connections to ESnet from just having 100 gigabit uh, to having 400 gigabit connections. So now we have, I, I just put the little picture there. So now we've got two connections because you know we, we have redundancy here um, and each of them has a 100 and a 400 so that makes a total of one terabit of external networking connectivity so 
should be able to get your data here and, and out and everything a lot faster now. Um, we've done a network refresh to our storage systems. Uh, we retired Corey. You may have known something about that. I don't know if I probably never told you all about that. So it's a kind of a surprise, I'm sure. Um, and we completed our acceptance process on Perlmutter. So Perlmutter is ready to go and happy and you all are using it. That's great. All right. So we have maintained really high system availability this year. Um, so if you look at this beautiful graph here, you can see the blue is Corey, the red is HPSS, and the yellow is CFS, that's the community file system. So those are uh, the ones that we measured until June, obviously, we retired Corey on May 31st. So in June, we started having uh, Perlmutter instead. But you can see it has it has remained uh, pretty high our availability. Um, so what this what this measures is scheduled availability. So we have we have outages sometimes, right? And so you subtract out those times, but that that we had scheduled outages. So this is really did we have any unscheduled outages? And yeah, we had a little bit, um, but overall, you know, we're up in the high nineties percent wise on Perlmutter, and so that's looking really good. Now the, the total system availability, this does take into account any scheduled outages that we have. Um, and so we've had to have a few scheduled outages to make some fixes on Perlmutter. Um, but still, every month we've remained in the 90s. Um, and then of course on the community file system, which is just pretty rock solid, we've had 100% uptime. And HPSS, we've had a lot of 100% uptimes on that one too. So. That is um, that is how we've done on system availability. Now, another thing that I think you all may be interested in is system utilization. So this has to do with you know the systems up and everything, but how many jobs are running? Like, is it full? Um, and the fuller that we can pack it, then the more hours you all can get, and the more science that you can get done. So. Uh, as you can guess here, the, the, the blue is Cori system utilization, and then after Cori retired, we started measuring Perlmutter's utilization. And um, so you can see that our system utilization is pretty high. Um, we, we like it when it's in the 90%. If it could be a little bit higher, that would be even better uh, for us. But um, sometimes it takes a little while for us to really tune the scheduler so that we can get the most out of the machine. Okay, now this is something that's really great news for you all, and that is that queue wait times are really low right now. So that means you put your job in, last year at this time, you put your job into Corey, you could have to wait 50 hours for your job to start. But now your average job is gonna start within a couple of hours. So I think that's pretty nice, really. So I hope that that can encourage people who are listening here to go ahead and submit more jobs and, um, you know, they're gonna make it through. So let's talk next about allocations and utilization in this, in this year. Okay, so first let's talk about our allocation levels. So. We talked to Jordan, or in this case, her predecessor, um, about uh, how, how much time that we have to give off of these machines, how many node hours that it's realistic for us to provide. Um, and so, so we, set, we set these allocation levels, I think back in 2021, maybe. So what we agreed to was in, in 2022, we would do 24.65 million CPU node hours and 3.4 million GPU node hours. And so our thought process there was we would have Corey for the full year of 2022, and we would have Perlmutter for half the year of 2022. That's, that's kind of what we, how we thought it would all work out. And so then in, from 2023 to 2025, you see we have the same levels for both of these. So we have 15.4, 
a million CPU node hours and 6.85 million GPU node hours um, because that's how much Perlmutter it alone can provide. So, uh, so that's what we have planned towards. So in 2022, we exceeded our allocation targets um, by quite a bit, actually. So we managed to deliver 27.89 million CPU node hours to mission science. When we, if you looked back a slide, we were supposed to give 24.65 million. So y'all really came out ahead last year. Um, and then uh, GPU node hours, we were able to, to deliver 4.54 million node hours when we were targeting 3.4 million. So again, y'all came out really ahead. Um, so that was because we were able to have Perlmutter around that whole time. And, and the Perlmutter CPU nodes are also part of what helped us to be able to deliver this much uh, compute to you all. <laughs> Okay, so now how are we doing in 2023? So we had these similar graphs last year in our um, in our uh, presentation. So uh, these these are actually graphs I pulled off of Iris just this weekend. Um, and so the gray straight line there, that is the target. So if we have our total allocation, and if if everyone was using it uniformly every day then it would follow this, this line here. Um, instead, uh, what we have is the red line. That is the hours that we have delivered, okay? And you can see that red line is like way above the, the, the gray line. Um, and in fact, it's getting, getting near to uh, the total that we needed to provide for the whole year. Um, and then sort of that, I don't know, cyan colored one, um, uh, at the bottom there, that's the hours that we've charged. And so that includes any kind of discounts. So um, the reason that we are so far ahead on this is because we didn't expect to have Corey for the first half of the year, but we did. Um, and so we were kind of able to deliver a, a lot more node hours there. Um, so it was, so you can see where it starts leveling off, <laughs> you know, at the end of, uh, right there kind of at the end, end of Corey's lifespan. But um, it's still, we're still going up. And of course we know, we feel very confident that we are gonna make it to deliver all of what we need to deliver. Um, so nobody stopped using the CPU nodes, but at the same time, if you slowed it down, it wouldn't be the end of the world at this point for us in terms of being able to deliver what we promised. But keep using it, please. Okay, now with GPU usage, um, so this is the same type of graph again, the, the gray is if we were uniformly using every day, you know, one 365th of the allocation, right? Um, and so you can see the, uh, the red line here, um, it was kind of a little bit down below, you know, in order for us to be able to fully deliver uh, what we've promised, but now we're right at the target pace. And so um, we encourage you all to keep using those GPU nodes. That's why we've really been focusing on that. You may have noticed we've got the GPU office hours going on. We've got um, some incentives to use GPUs right now. Um, and our charging, which includes discounts, you can see is extremely low, but that doesn't matter. What matters is the number of no node hours that we've delivered. To science and so I think we're on pace everybody just needs to keep going keep using the machine and keep cranking out the science okay now uh, I did some scatter plots here so um, what this scatter plot represents is on the x-axis this is people's allocation in in thousands of CPU node hours and then the y-axis is their usage in terms of CPU node hours. So um, what's interesting is we have, um, we have a lot of people really who are using a lot more CPU hours, 
um, then, then they uh, were allocated, which is great. There's no problem with that. Um, and of course, this is attributable to the fact that we had Corey available for so many more months. And in this in this graph, I mean, I think we're we're counting a node hour as a node hour without any kind of discount for accounting for Corey's lower power. Um, so anyway, we have some really enterprising people. Like I, I want to congratulate whoever this is right here. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Um, very, very proud of you, whoever you are. Um, but then I want to maybe scold some of these people, like these people, whoever you are, get working, okay? <laughs> All right. Um, so here's a similar graph for our GPU usage. So again, we're nearly at pace. So this is this is a trend line. So what I would expect, or what I would hope, anyway, is that the trend line would sort of be at, you know three quarters of the total allocation, right? Because like, so we kind of have a slope of three quarters because we're about three quarters through the year, uh, but it's lower than that. So uh, again, though, I'm, I'm very impressed with you people here. Congratulations, I don't know how you did that. And then this, these people here, they need to get going. Okay. All right, so next I'm going to talk about uh, user satisfaction. So this is my favorite topic, of course, because this is my part of the job. So in uh, so we have had an annual survey since 1998. So happen to know that's 25 years. Um, in 2019, we began outsourcing the survey to a company called MBRI. They provide data tracking, um, statistical analyses, and text analyses, and they can analyze, especially now, now that we've had several years of it, uh, they're able to kind of uh, provide us with some, some history and kind of like trends and so forth. So in our 2022 survey, um, we, uh, we used to have, we used to say, okay, we're going to get as many users as we possibly can. We should get 10% of all of our users to, to do the survey. Um, it seems like the number of people doing the survey, it, it's really hard to get 10% of, of NERSC users. If you figure we have 9,000 users, that's 900 people. Right, so that's pretty hard to do. Um, so instead we went with a confidence level statistic here. So um, we got enough people so that we were at like the 99.9% .9 confidence level that the results of the survey were correct and that um, statistically that they um, adequate they, they accurately reflected um, our users uh, uh, so anyway we had 21 questions that have a scale of one to six and then we had three respond three free response questions and then we also added another question if you if you said um, I'm really dissatisfied with HPSS then a question would pop up that would say, how could your experience with HPSS be improved? So uh, anyway, we got 504 responses, which represented 5.31% of everyone that we surveyed. Um, but they were a, a diverse group, so they represented projects that used 81% of the total hours charged in 2022. So, um, Y'all remained very satisfied with NERSC. Um, you know, we try to get on this scale of one to six, we try to get a, at least a 4.5, like that would be a minimum. Um, and so of course we're far exceeding that. 89% uh, of you gave us either a five or a six, in fact, on overall satisfaction. Um, and I think that is the like the one required question. All the other ones are optional, but um, you still gave us some really helpful feedback, which we really appreciated. So uh, services overall, you know, we got a pretty good score there with 90% of you giving us a five or six. Um, and computing resources, 85% of you gave us a five or a six. Um, so you may see these uh, results are lower than they were in 2021. Um, however, that, is, that was not considered to be a statistically significant change. Um, so then let's talk about problem resolution. So 
You may also know of these as tickets. So some of you send in tickets to us. We love it. It keeps us employed. Uh, so we have, I have a team of about 20 people um, with diverse expertise and significant experience in science and computational science. And so those people uh, answer your questions. And if they can't answer it, there's somebody else who can. So we might have to pass off your your question to someone else in our staff uh, to address it. And so for those of you who don't, who've never sent in a ticket, because there are some of you who haven't sent in a ticket, um, you can just go to help.nurse.gov and log in, and that's how you can send us a question. And we'd love to answer your questions. Um, and don't be shy, especially if you're new. I know some new people tend to be shy. They tend to think, oh, I might ask them a stupid question or I might waste their time. But really, there's no stupid questions and you won't waste our time. So just ask if you have a question. Save yourself time and effort if you really can't figure something out. Okay, so our teams answered uh, 6,079 tickets last year from 2,664 unique users. Now we tried to, we have um, a, a service level agreement with you that we will address at least 80% of all tickets within three business days. We will solve that problem for you. You know, you will get a satisfactory resolution. Um, last year, we managed to get that 92.3%. Uh, so go us. Um, I was really pleased with that, actually. Uh, and so then we asked you all in the user survey, uh, you know, what do you think? Um, how is our consulting service? Um, what's the quality of our technical advice? Uh, how fast are we? Are we too slow? <laughs> uh, and so you answered. And so once again, we tried to get at least a 4.5 on, on this. We've, of course, exceeded that. Um, and 90% of you all gave us a five or a six on, on those um, categories of questions. So, so thank you. And we'll keep working for you and try to earn this again in the next years. So um, this is an interesting thing. So um, we get tickets and it's kind of, it can be kind of seasonal, uh, the different types that we get. So uh, you can see kind of a big bump there in, in January. Uh, a lot of those are, you know, new allocation year sort of questions, that type of thing. I'm actually not sure why we had a big bump in March last year. Unknown, <clears throat> mystery. Um, I couldn't find any, any clear cause of that. But, but everything else, you know, is basically kind of levels off until we get to December when people are finally relaxing, having a holiday and stuff, then we don't get as many tickets. So uh, anyway, I just thought that was kind of an interesting thing to show you all that you might appreciate. Um, and then here's another one about what you ask us about, because you ask us about a lot of different things. Um, so last year, the biggest ones were on data management, um, logging in and submitting or running jobs. Those are, those are perennial favorites, I think. Um, we get a lot of questions about uh, about those topics. How you know, like, how can you best stage your data, and how can you, you know, where where should you store your data? And uh, and then we also get some questions about logging in, um, but then submitting or running jobs. We get a lot of questions about uh, people's uh, job scripts, and you know, why is my job? taking so long in the queue, although we don't get those questions right now. So keep submitting more jobs, then, then we can get more of those questions. Um, anyway, you can see there, that there's really a wide variety. The, the point of showing you this, there's a wide variety of topics that you all ask us about. And um, you know, everyone on my team really needs to kind of have some, some vast, wide expertise uh, in a lot of different things, because you just never know what you're going to get asked. It makes it makes the job kind of fun, I think. Okay, so um, like I said before, uh, the NBRI 
um, they do an analysis of the text of the three questions that we ask you on the survey. So the, 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 the free form questions that we ask you are, um, what does nurse do well? How can nurse serve you better? And then anything else you wanna say. <laughs> so one of them is like, we're fishing for compliments, yes. The other one is though, we're, we're trying to get some advice from you, how we can do better for you. And then the third one is grab bag if there's anything um, that you that wasn't covered otherwise. Um, and so the things that people really like are our computational resources, which I think that makes sense. I'm not sure why you'd work with NERSC otherwise if you weren't interested in that. Um, you, you like our user support, you like our training. A lot of you like our software because you find it easy to use and that there's a lot available. Um, and then a lot of you like our documentation because you find it very thorough and comprehensive. And I know that to be true, actually, I used to work in Australia, and whenever we had a question about a, a CRA system, we would look at NERSC's documentation. Um, so then uh, on the negative side, uh, you weren't particularly happy about our cues, especially the wait times, but also the short wall time that we have on Perlmutter. Uh, file systems, um, that was related to the next one, which is stability, because there were there were quite a few problems with stability where Perlmutter was causing problems on a file system that would then percolate through and propagate to uh, Cori as well. Um, software, you want additional software that we didn't provide. And then documentation. Some people found our documentation too highly technical and it, they found it hard to find things. So it, it's interesting that the last two are the same. <laughs> Both, they're both positive and negative. Um, the biggest positive impact, according to NBRI's analysis, was our computational resources. So our systems are, uh, you know, not just the compute systems, but the file system, and the HPSS system, and SPIN, and all of our other uh, systems that we offer. And then the biggest negative impact was reliability. Um, and so that was especially because of outages that we had that were related to Perlmutter. Okay, so um, so next I'm going to talk about what's happening in the new year, in the next year. And so then I guess when I give this talk again next year, then I can see how many of these things came true. Um, okay, anyway, so first let me just mention all of that data was based on our user survey. And we really need uh, you to fill out the user survey. So we expect it's going to commence for this year in late October or early November, so month or six weeks from now, you will get a link from NBRI asking for your feedback. Um, and we want you to do the survey so that you can help us understand what we're doing well and how we can improve. Uh, and so any of your feedback, we read all of your feedback, we look at it all, we try to, um, you know, we do what we, what we can um, with your suggestions, and we just really look forward to hearing from you so that we can know if we're going in the right direction or if we need to pivot in any way. Okay. So another thing that's happening right now is ERCAP. ERCAP is open for proposals. So ERCAP, I don't remember the acronym precisely, but it's something to do with energy research computing allocations process. Okay, I think I got that right. Sounds about right. It's, it's approximately right, yes. Uh, basically, it's just applying for NERSC resources. So actually, you can apply year round for ERCAP, um, but for best results, if you, want some, if you want a significant amount of resources for allocation year 2024, you should apply before October 2nd. Because what happens is that after ERCAP closes, um, then we, uh, the allocation managers from DOE take all of those proposals and they look through them and then they give out allocations. And, they, and during that period, they give out the bulk of their allocations for the next year. So you really want to be in that group if you possibly can. Um, we'll announce the results about the second week of December or so. 
Uh, and be sure to stay tuned this afternoon. We're going to have a session on writing good ERCAP proposal from 1.30 to 2.30. And I realized I should have put the URL for ERCAP on here, but it's pretty easy to remember. You just go to ERCAP.NERSC.gov, and that will open up. You'll have to log in. It opens up to uh, the same system, actually, that we use for our online help desk. Uh, but it, it'll point you at the ERCAP section of that, where you can apply for um, an allocation for next year. If you Google ERCAP, it brings you to NERSC allocation request. Okay, useful. If you Google for ERCAP, it brings you to the NERSC allocation request form. Excellent. Okay, so we have some exciting upgrades coming up here. So we've got some storage upgrades coming up. Uh, so we, we're in the middle of a DTN refresh. So DTN stands for data transfer nodes. So we're doing some hardware and software upgrades on those, which should be complete by the end of this year. Um, and so that includes the upgrades to Globus, which you may have seen um, those being announced in the weekly email as well, because I know that everyone here reads that religiously. <laughs> yes, I know you do. Um, okay, another thing that's happening is uh, we're going to increase the capacity on the community file system. So that's going to happen. Yeah. That means just size or also performance? This I'm talking about specifically the size. Yeah, we're going to increase the size on it. Um, and so that will uh, enable you all to use even more uh, storage on the community file system. Uh, so in the first half of 2024, uh, we're also going to do some HPSS upgrades, some improvements there. So the first thing we're going to do is, this is maybe too technical, but a database partitioning for better metadata performance. But what that just means is that your interactive commands will, will go faster. And then we're also installing a fourth tape library. So that'll be even more capacity in HPSS. Um, and then... Uh, in the second half of 2024, we're going to test some newer tape drives and media to increase the capacity of, of the archive. So that's the really nice thing um, about our archive is that uh, every so often we can just kind of go in and upgrade the, the tapes and the, and the media um, drives and stuff uh, to increase the capacity without actually changing the size of the, the drive itself. But if you just get higher density tape, um, then you can store more data. And then another thing that we're working on is uh, REST API interfaces for HPSS clients to sort of modernize the HPSS experience, if you will. Okay, now um, another infrastructure upgrade is that we're doubling the bandwidth to the CFS fabric <coughs> interconnect. So in this previous one, like I said, I was talking about just the capacity increase, but we're also going to double the bandwidth. So that should improve the performance of using the community file system. And then we're going to update uh, our network equipment to increase the network reliability and bandwidth to SPIN, Iris, Jupyter, and other NERSC services. Uh, and so, you know, in the, in the weekly email, I announced yesterday about this move of a, of a storage system. Um, that's part of this whole process, um, and while we're doing this process of moving, uh, migrating a lot of the, the uh, hardware to support SPIN and other uh, auxiliary services, while we're moving them, we're also increasing the uh, network reliability for, for those systems. And so that's, uh, I think that's going to be really exciting once it's completed. Okay, um, and then finally, Nurse 10. Uh, we'll probably solicit proposals for Nurse 10. That's going to come out soon. And we may even make the decision for the architecture. That's all I can say. <laughs> I don't know if we'll announce it. I don't know anything about that. But it's likely that these two things will be happening next year. Okay, um, now I want to talk about the nurse user experience. Of course, this is the part that's nearest and dearest to my heart. Um, so. Basically, our goal in, in my group is um, world domination. No, mm -hmm. it's um, making NERSC the best place to compute, right? We want, this, we want NERSC to be your favorite place and not just because 
all the other places aren't good, but because NERSC is awesome. And that wasn't me saying all the other places aren't good. They're all great, I'm sure. But NERSC, of course, we want it to be the best place to compute. So one thing that we've done is we started a new user experience initiative headed by a woman named Annette Greiner in NERSC. Um, she has a lot of experience with UX research and, and stuff. And so we're investigating and implementing improvements basically at the interface between you and NERSC. Um, we want to improve the new user onboarding experience. So I already mentioned about a quarter of you are brand new every year. Um, and so uh, we also got the feedback that our documentation, for example, is kind of difficult for novice users to navigate. So we're going to update our documentation. Um, we're going to try to re do more targeted training regarding uh, specific demographics, especially um, novice users. And we're looking at uh, short video modules as a supplement to our written materials. It's, I got to say, um, you know, as an old Gen Xer, I like to read things. And if the only way I can find out information is a video, then I guess I'm not learning that. But, <laughs> but the youth of today um, are very different. Um, and they actually, they're the opposite, right? They're like, if there's, I'm going to find a video on TikTok and I'm going to learn about NERSC. Well, unfortunately, we can't, we can't uh, post to TikTok, but uh, we do think that um, video modules they, that that people will, for whatever strange reason, um, that people will actually uh, be really interested in those, and and that would be a great supplement to the written materials. Okay, so. We want to be able to work with you all better, and we want you all to be able to work with us better. So, um, like I mentioned, our onboarding improvements. Um, we think that, you know, when somebody arrives at NERSC, they probably don't know how to use NERSC. So if we can catch them at the beginning, then they can know how to use NERSC and develop really good habits and use it efficiently and more effectively, and then, you know, more compute for everyone and more science and yay. Okay, so that's that's one thing that we're that we're really uh, motivated to do. Um, another thing is we really want to have more synergies with PIs. So we know that uh, PIs have a, a challenge, especially with you know onboarding new members of their teams, and we want to enhance our dialogue with PIs on your resources, your needs, your plans, your goals, and how we can help support those and improve. Uh, your overall workflows from start to finish. And I'm not, I'm not specifically talking about your compute workflows, I'm talking about all of it. So onboarding people, offboarding people, um, and everywhere in between. Um, so like I mentioned, we've got our UX initiative, um, looking at how to make our docs better, tools, um, search engines, interfaces, things like that to Im improve your experience. Um, we really want to understand better the, the different user communities um, that we have at NERSC. So I, I like to joke that I think some of you view NERSC as kind of a maybe a toaster. Um, you know, it's something that you you use as a tool in your research, but it's not something that you could think of forming a, a, a community around necessarily. Uh, but I'd like to challenge you to instead of thinking of NERSC as a toaster, maybe you could think of NERSC as an instant pot. Have you ever seen the instant pot community? People <laughs> trading recipes all the time. People giving each other advice on how to best use the instant pot. Um, and honestly, a lot of you do the same things. I mean, maybe you're a nuclear physicist or maybe you're a, you know, a computational biologist, but you run jobs, you you know, stage data, you store data, you know, you do all of the same things, even if it's not for this exact same purpose. So I think that you could learn a lot from one another. And so um, that's kind of where we're hoping to go with that is have a community of practice, which we've talked about before in various uh, nurse meetings. And, um, and then you can trade your instant pot recipes together. Um, anyway, um, and then another thing is that we think that we could also 
work with our peer centers like OLCF and ALCF. You may notice in our in the nurse weekly email and on our website, uh, you see a lot of trainings that are joint offerings between us and our other uh, peer centers like OLCF and ALCF. Or sometimes we just advertise their training that we think might be relevant to our users. Um, so there's that already in place, but you know, special interest groups, maybe there's a common interest across you know, VASP users across all three centers or something like that. Um, and then of course, you know, we have a great deal of expertise and so do they at these other centers. So maybe, uh, maybe we would benefit from sharing expertise with one another. Okay. All right, so uh, one of the last things I wanted to mention is that uh, next year is the 50th anniversary of NERSC. So NERSC was founded in 1974 at Lawrence Livermore National Lab uh, to provide computing for magnetic fusion open scientific research. So we were the first open science HPC center. And so just want you to be prepared to look for some fun celebrations of NERSC in the next year. Of course, if you have any ideas or you want to contribute, please let us know. Um, hard to believe that we are 50 years young. And then that is really all I have. So I just have a brief summary slide. Um, 